Thank you, thank you, singers and musicians. Open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, and we'll begin our study with about verse 5. And while you're turning to that part of the Word of God, let me preface what I shall say. On television the other night, I had the privilege of hearing a lengthy interview with a gentleman who had been in a concentration camp in World War II, a man of Jewish extraction, an educated man, a man that was fortunate to live through that awful Holocaust. And listening to him talk, and how that many in those concentration camps could not survive. They lost their minds. They went uh, completely out of themselves, so to speak. They lost their ability to uh, reason and their suffering, their anger, their fright, all of this totally destroyed them. And he went into a lengthy discussion on how he was able to survive. And since being liberated from a prison camp, he spent the rest of his life working with uh, disturbed children and young people. And I listened to this story with a great deal of, of feeling because it's hard for us who have never gone through an experience like that to really understand what that suffering meant to those people. And yet on the other hand, today in our society here in America, uh, in our educational system, in uh, television, and in the press, the printing of magazines, pornography, and a lot of other things, I wonder if you adult people have ever really tried to put yourself in a position where these youngsters of ours really are today and, and try to figure out with all of the cross currents that, they, uh, br that they're brainwashed with, I just wonder, do you, uh, do you uh, really understand what these kids and these young people are going through? I'm afraid that far too many adult people and people who really know the Lord spend too little time trying to figure out uh, what these kids and the brainwashing that they go through. For 37 weeks a year or thereabout, they're in an educational system here in this country that tells them they came from the animal kingdom, that there's not any absolutes, and they just happen to be what they are. And uh, in the teaching and in the textbooks, they're brainwashed to that about 37 weeks out of the year. And then in their studies in the libraries, the same thing. And then many of them that happen to go to religious services, they hear the man of God, supposedly, the man of God, criticize the Bible and says the Bible doesn't mean this. And that's not what the Bible says. And you can't trust all of it. When that youngster gets home and they get alone in their room, have you ever tried to figure out what their thoughts really are? What do they have to stake their eternal destiny upon? Don't you people understand that in, in the media, in, in, uh, look at all of the rock concerts we have, the music, and the heroes, the people who are supposed to be role models for these young people in the entertainment field, when it's all said and done, and that 15 or 17-year-old or 20-year-old gets in their room at home or in the dormitory and begins to think, what under God do they have to anchor them? They don't have anything. And then we sit back and we hear the First Lady say on television, 
I'm not criticizing, say no to drugs. Well, why say no to drugs? If I'm an animal, why shouldn't I enjoy myself? What's wrong with that? If I'm an animal and I happen to kill somebody, what's wrong with that? I mean, people, let's, let's, let's be factual and honest with ourselves. And with this generation of youngsters that's growing up in our society today, well, I'd like to say, and I must hurry on, I could belabor this point, but I've got some absolutes. I've got some things that I want to leave with you and with you young people. And we're starting here in verse 5 in this tremendous chapter that tells us so much about God's Lamb. In verse 4 it said, It's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. In other words, sacrifices offered by human beings will not get the job done. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, that speaking of Jesus, he saith, Sacrifice an offering that thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. You might underscore that word prepared. When our Savior came, and we'll celebrate his birthday shortly, so-called in this country, we call it Christmas, did he just by accident come? Was he divine but not sovereign? Who is this Jesus, this babe? History cannot be disputed. He was born in Bethlehem. There's too much evidence for us to try to refute that. So the liberals and the modernists say that he was divine but only like other men. And so you can begin to see that young people today have no reason to have faith. The adult population of this country, beginning in our educational institutions, in our churches, in the political system, and in the uh, monetary system that we have in this country, our young people, don't, they, they really don't stand a ghost of a chance. It's really sad. They're going to have to hear someone that will tell them about some absolutes. Amen. Now here in this verse of scripture, we are told that God Almighty, a sovereign God, prepared a body for the Savior to live in while he was here upon this earth. And in this body he was to be offered as a burnt offering as a trespass offering, as a peace offering, as a sin offering for mankind, for humankind. So he had a body prepared for him. And I like that. I like the way it's stated here. A body hast thou prepared me. You know, later on, one of the writers said he bore our sins in his own body upon the tree. And then in Galatians, he bore our curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. So he was made a curse for us. Notice the word I use, made a curse for us. He was made a sin offering for us. Here are some absolutes. It would seem to me, young person, or Bible skeptic, that you would explore whether or not these ancient truths in this book called the Bible, whether or not they will hold that they are, uh, that they're reliable and you can depend upon it. Well, history tells us there was a man called Jesus who was born in Bethlehem and he came in a body God had prepared for him in the womb of a virgin Jewish girl that he might become the sin offering for our sins. A body hast thou prepared me. It wasn't an accident. It didn't come through the process of evolution. But God in his infinite sovereign power and wisdom prepared a sin offering for the sons of Adam 
that we might not have to perish, but that we could be saved. To me, that's the greatest truth of all time. John identified him as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Never a man spake like this man called Jesus. He raised the dead. He gave strength to the crippled, sight to the blind. My friend, how could anybody deny the fact that Jesus Christ was supernatural in every way? He, at, at the conception, it is supernatural. A woman that had never known, according to her own testimony, a man, and yet she became pregnant. And that holy thing, as the prophet said, would be the Savior of the world. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us, Amen. Savior. Not only that, behold, a virgin shall conceive. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. A child is born and the son is given. He combines finitude and infinitude in one person. God in human flesh, yet without sin. Amen. Think of it. That'll boggle your mind, brother. And yet it's a reality. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. I don't understand all of the mysteries of the other world, and I can't understand a lot of the mysteries today. But a long time ago, I anchored my faith to this eternal truth that the Savior came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And I haven't been disappointed in him yet. And I believe, ladies and gentlemen, it'll hold true right on through until I arrive on the celestial shores of the new Jerusalem. Amen. Don't try to take away my faith. Don't tell me that man has come up through the process of evolution. Man has been going down ever since he sinned in the Garden of Eden. Man used to live nearly a thousand years. But because of disease, because of all of these things that's come up on the sons of fallen Adam, our days have been shortened. No one lives as long as Noah did, 930 years, or as long as Methuselah did, 969 years. But I'll tell you one thing, ladies and gentlemen, for those of us who have believed on his name, we'll never die. Believest thou this? John chapter 11. But then I want you to go to Matthew chapter 25. And you'll find that he prepared a kingdom. In verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, young people, let me help your faith. Don't you let somebody tell you, another human being just like you, there's no hereafter, that you're like an animal, and when your days are finished upon this earth, that that's the end of human existence. Don't you believe a word of it, because the word of God said there's a kingdom prepared for us, from the foundation of the world. Before the morning stars sang together, or ever the earth was, God knew everything. And he's prepared something special for those who put their trust in him. Now, brother, that's something that needs to be explored. He's prepared a kingdom for you from the foundation of the world. That means before this world uh, came into existence as we know it today. Why well, every week you can read in your newspaper about something about what some scientist says about this earth and how that it's been here all of these billions of years and how that a meteorite maybe have hit it and all of these accidents. And that's 
Uh, friend, you can believe that if you want to, but I don't believe a single word of it. I believe that everybody that believes evolution, everybody that teaches it, everybody that sanctions it, they are liars. Amen. Either they are liars or God is a liar. And you have to make a decision who you're going to believe. Well, this preacher believes God. Amen. Let every man be a liar, but let God be true. Who are you going to believe? That's the issue. You say, well, you'll hurt people's feelings calling them a liar. I could care a little about your feelings. Amen. But I'm very concerned about God's feelings. Right. And God doesn't like to be called a liar. And so he says here in the book that he's prepared for our special people a kingdom from the foundation of the world. What a thrill this is. What a challenge it is. Uh, I'm going to be a part of his kingdom. Amen. And live with him forever. Not only that, but he tells me that I am a child of his family. And if that be true, then we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And we will reign with him over this material universe. That's the business of believers in this generation in the church age. What a thrill that is. You know, the other day, the Prime Minister of England, Margaret Thatcher, through pressure in her own party, had to step down. What a great person she's been for that country. Uh, many people have already forgotten what a mess that our mother country was in when Margaret Thatcher took over. And she helped to stabilize that country. And she didn't want her country to become a part of the common market. And that may be the underlying reason why she had to step down. But let's just wait a minute. You can see thrones and powers and principalities becoming vacant. You know, if I were a communist like Fidel Castro or some of these idiots that we've had in this country like Jane Fonda, uh, that's been champions of communism. I, I mean, I would, I would go into the bathroom and stick my head in the, in the toilet bowl and flush it, and I think I'd just end my existence. Amen? Amen. Look at communism today. It's totally discredited. Started in about 1921, and here the nations, the democratic nations, of the world are now sending food to the Russians because they're starving. God have mercy on people that's so gullible and have been brainwashed with all of this stuff. Those of us who are Christians knew that communism was anti-God, just like uh, Noxism and Fosseism. All of those isms are anti-God, anti-Christ. Look where they are today. Mussolini's gone, Hitler's gone, Stalin or, or, or Lenin, and all of them are gone that have had a part in uh, communism becoming a world power. And here Russia is having to be fed or else her citizens, will, many of them will starve. What a debacle. It seemed to me like that the people of this world would have sense enough to be sober and to think. And by the way, those Russians over there crying out for Bibles, and my friends who have been over there, I have been over there, the Russians will stand for two hours in the rain in services to hear the Word of God taught. You tell me that there's not a hungering of the Word of God in that godless country that has been overrun by the communists, where is communism today? It's a failure. But the gospel of Jesus Christ lives on. Amen. And it's as powerful today as it's ever been. Amen. And we Christians have a kingdom that is not of this world. But it will crush the kingdoms of this world and grind them to bits. Amen. And it will reign forever. My friend, Amen. I want to tell you something. This is important. Let's go over here and look at Psalms. Psalms chapter 9 and verse 7. 
But the, that Psalms chapter 9 verse 7. But the Lord shall endure forever. Now watch what he's prepared. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. In other words, he judges with equity the people of this earth. He'll never give a man what he doesn't deserve. But I can assure you, my friend, a just and a righteous God will judge every man justly. And don't kid yourself. Because every son of Adam is coming to a judgment day. Did you notice what verse 7 said? He hath prepared his throne for judgment. John said in Revelation chapter 20, he looked out into outer space and he saw a throne suspended in outer space. And I saw a great white throne and he that sat upon it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And he saw the sea giving up the dead and the graves giving up the dead and hell giving up the dead. And they all stand before God. You tell me that God hasn't prepared a throne of judgment? Come on, people. You'll never hear a liberal preacher talk about this. But I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there's a judgment day coming. You know, here in our country, our courts now are presided over by the liberals that came out of the uh, hippie movement. It's extremely hard today. I don't say that all judges are, but I want to tell you something. It's extremely hard to get a just rendering today in court because uh, justice has gone out the window in many instances. But I want to tell you something. This court order here is going to be just right. There's not going to be any prejudice. There's not going to be any racial overtones. There's not but going to be any quotas. But every man shall be judged according as his work shall be. Did you really get that? But the Lord shall endure forever. That means he's never going to, he's not going to destroy himself. He's forever. And he hath prepared his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. It's going to be right what he judges. And my friend, what a shaking and moving that's going to be when that happens. You, you may not care too much about judgment day, but I want to tell you something. The older I grow and the more I know about the book and understand the righteousness of God and the justice of God, the more I tremble when I think of mankind having to meet God. Friend, it's not going to be very pleasant. Sometimes we Christians get all worked up and we think about, oh, glory be, just so I get to heaven. That's not all. There's a judgment day over there. And Christians alike will have to be judged. Paul said there's a judgment for the believer. And we'll be judged according as our deeds have been done, both good and bad. The wasted years, the selfishness, the greed, the lust, the hatred, the animosity, the gossip, the lying, the stealing, all of it. God will judge with equity the peoples of this earth. That's what we don't like to hear. But I'll tell you one thing. It helps us to stop and think about it. It'll help you to analyze your week as to what you think needs to be done. And to give of yourself. But that's not all of it. Go back to Matthew again. I want you to get Matthew chapter 25. And I want to read verse 41. Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 25, verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them, talking about the, the nations on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, 
in the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice that. Only statement like this in the Bible. And you find it here in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41. There is an everlasting fire and it was prepared for the devil and his angels. There's a preparation place for wicked angels and cherubims. And did you know that in Revelation chapter 20, that wicked man is put in that same everlasting fire? You say, I don't believe it. Well, let's go over there and look at it. Revelation chapter 20. You know what it says? I saw the dead small and great stand before God. The books were open, another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book according to their works. Now notice, this is a judgment of works. And the sea gave up the dead, and, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their, there it is again, the works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And that's called the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And that lake of fire was prepared, number one, for the devil and his angels. Strange that man, lost and condemned, would be put in with the devil and his angels. You see, a third of the angels followed Lucifer when they were cast out of heaven. And the angels are reserved in chains in darkness waiting the day of judgment. Now God's in no hurry. And the day of the judgment of the angels is coming on. They're waiting that day. And the beast and the false prophet, according to Revelation 20, are cast into that lake of fire in verse 10 of Revelation 20. I mean, God lets us know how this whole business is going to wind up. And if you resist Jesus Christ and you're not willing to be saved, I'm talking to perhaps church members that need to really look at your life, whether or not you've been saved. You can go to hell as quickly with your name on a church roll as if you have a bar stool down at the uh, at the bar, local bar. Just because you're a church member is not any guarantee that you're going to miss this lake of fire. My friend, your guarantee, guarantee to miss that lake of fire is to have eternal life given to you as a gift by the Lord God Himself. Amen. And when He says He gives unto believers eternal life, and you shall never perish. That's what you need. Amen. And that's the difference. So you see, there's a preparation. Now, if you don't believe that, you'll wind up in a lake of fire. There'll be no hope for you. You'll be finished. And you better get it straight, Amen. because you could be listening to the last message before death rings your doorbell, and you have to depart from this life. This man I bury Tuesday was stricken just two months ago with cancer. Didn't know he had it. Had no earthly idea I had cancer and lived 60 days. And now he's in eternity. Thank God he got saved. Amen. Listen to me on radio like some of you people. And it caused him to come to get saved. And it changed him from an unbeliever to a believer. He was walking the path of death and he he came to Jesus Christ and God gave him life and these years that he's had as a Christian, he led people to Christ, he witnessed to his fellow man and now he's enjoying the benefits of heaven. It's appointed unto man wants to die. He that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own destruction. Now, all of us have a choice of deciding who we're going to follow I said to a well-educated, well-trained man in one of the Eastern universities not long ago, 
when he told me he didn't believe in these eternal truths, I told him, I said, somebody's been messing with your head. You ought to have sense enough to think for yourself. Every person listening to me today, there was a time in your life when you didn't harbor these beliefs that are unbelief in actuality because somebody has led you to deny the existence of God, to deny this Bible, to deny that Jesus is the Savior. Well, thank God there's a great host of others who believe the opposite, that he came and tasted death for every man. And you came humbly to him and asked him to save you. And thank God he did. And that makes a difference. I tell you, beloved, let's go back now and look at something else he's prepared. And as I said, you don't have to believe it. You can think everything's an accident. Your mama's an accident. And, And while I'm talking about that, let me just say in the earlier service today, and we had the baby dedication. After I'd preached, I had the opportunity of really experiencing something that was precious. A young woman knew of a girl that was going to have a baby or else have an abortion. And the story came to me that this young woman pregnant out of wedlock, as I understand it. She was right on the verge of having an abortion. Now listen, you pro, uh, you pro-abortionist. She was just ready, and this wonderful lady talked the girl out of it and uh, talked her into carrying the baby the full nine months. And she did. And this girl made all of the necessary contacts. And thank God, this little baby was adopted by the people who were here today. And I want to tell you people something. I've never seen a sweeter child, beautiful little baby girl. How you could keep from loving that child. And I took her little hand and she patted my hand. She's a few months old. I don't know just how old. And a very infectious smile came over her face. Loving, responsive. And I looked at that little innocent face and I thought, a few months ago, her natural mother was on the verge of having her killed. But in the providence of God, somebody intervened. And I thought... Oh, how many, many lost people, if we could get to them in time, would not self-destruct or destroy themselves or let somebody destroy them, but we could help them to live and live forever. My friend, that's what the gospel of Christ is all about. And in Revelation 21, verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Listen to what John saw. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared, there's that word again, as a bride adorned for her husband. Notice that, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Thank God that's our home and we'll live in it one day. Wouldn't you like to have a mansion there you can have. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Listen to what John saw. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared, there's that word again, as a bride adorned for her husband. Notice that, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Thank God that's our home, and we'll live in it one day. Wouldn't you like to have a mansion there? You can have. If you just bow where you are and say, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
save me for Jesus' sake. You know what? He'll save you with an everlasting salvation. And you can live in that city of God in a mansion forever 